Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Dr. Glenn Tonser from Kansas State University. Uh, Glenn is a professor at uh, Kansas State University in economics. Glenn, how are you today? Doing well, Laura. Thanks for having me on. Oh, wonderful to have you here. If you wouldn't mind taking just a minute or so to help our audience know a little bit more about you, I think that would be a great start. Sure. So I grew up on a hog farm, uh, fair to finish in Northeast Missouri. Uh, it was about 40 minutes from the Iowa border and 20 from Illinois. So the Northeast corner, very proud of those roots. Uh, I graduated high school in 1998. I usually share that because I am a, um, you know, the result of challenges in the industry more than 20 years ago. Uh, we lived through the sequence of too many hogs relative to shackle space. I mean, I fully recognize what that was about when I was still on the farm. That's relevant sitting here for this recording in October of 2021 as we're going through some still lingering pandemic oriented challenges, capacity discussions. Um, I left the farm, went to college. So I went to what's now Missouri State University. It used to be Southwest Missouri State down in Springfield, Missouri. Came here to K-State, got my PhD. Then I was at Michigan, so at Michigan State for four years. And then since 2010, uh, my wife and broader family and I have been back here outside Manhattan, Kansas. And my current role is, as you said, professor in the Agriculture Economics Department. Wonderful. I think this will be a really exciting conversation today, or certainly a, a nice, relevant conversation um, the reason why is, is you and I were visiting just before this was went to the grocery store the other day, bought a pound of bacon. Um, prices are high. Um, I've heard it from many people out in the public spectrum, trying to understand what's going on, um, with hog prices right now. And so I wanted to kind of just throw that out there and, and see if you could start to give us some, some ideas of what's currently happening in the industry. Yeah, so we'll work our way towards bacon, but right. I know we have a little bit of time here, so I'm going to start broader. Yes. And you know, th this might sound like a nightmare to some of our listeners. The economist is talking at you, uh, but supply and demand is what we use to describe right the prices and quantities we observe in any marketplace, and that certainly holds in the pork space. And the supply side tends to be better understood than the demand side. And almost all my comments here are going to be from a U.S. perspective, so that's the disclaimer up front. But we have things like USDA reports that are used around the world, not just in the US. And they largely quantify the number of animals or breeding intentions and things like that, which is inventory counting, right? That's supply side metrics, but don't really do it, do a service and it's not their purpose, so it's okay to understand demand. And I usually interject here, Laura, that it's really important whether you run a, a seed stock operation, you know, fairing operation, finishing operation, or all the way to the meat side, even if you are at a restaurant level, all the way through this vertically connected chain, all the revenue available to you starts with end user consumer demand. So you and I are two of many on this planet that are those end user consumers that demand protein, in this example, pork. And it's really important to go further with that is understanding demand is important because that's where your opportunities start from. Those dollars trickle from there is why I say that. But secondly, there's three different market channels so we have export or foreign demand for U.S. pork products. We have the domestic retail, right, your grocery store, which is where those bacon comments are most prevalent at the moment, or the domestic food service, think restaurants, and to be complete here, um, hospitality and so forth also falls in a bucket. But all of our protein goes through one of those three channels. And protein is fairly expensive when you talk about what hits our plates. So we try as a world to not waste much of it, right? So it usually goes through one of those channels and hits a consumer whether it's somebody like me in Kansas at a restaurant, somebody in Iowa at a grocery store, or maybe somebody in China, right, be an export consumer, is that's really important to understand those differences. We also don't send equal proportions of the gilt or the barrow through those market channels. Uh, we tend to export things that look and smell, taste a little bit different than what stays at home because the demand for them is different. The comparative advantage of the U.S. system is different than some of our global competitors around the world is part of that. But that's not just domestic versus foreign. Even staying at home, we don't send equal proportion through food service and restaurants. And a bit of a history lesson for our listeners, you know, we're now more than a year and a half into the pandemic. I hope towards the end of it. But again, I'm not Nostradamus. I'm not an epidemiologist. I have no clue on that front. But more than 18 months ago, we were in the heat of the economy shutting down. And one of the main impacts that had for protein demand was food service. So away from home, meat demand took a serious hit because foot traffic through restaurants took a hit. People quit getting on planes. We didn't stay at hotels. 
uh, folks like me that used to travel a lot, I ate a lot of pork products at a hotel breakfast when I was traveling a lot, right? I mean, pork owns breakfast. It still does, but the nature of that has changed. And specific to bacon, it was something like two thirds of the bacon that was consumed domestically was away from home pre COVID. Well, when you shut down restaurants, I mean, literally for weeks on ends and we're slowly getting it back open and then just general traffic travel took a hit that hit bacon demand more than say loin. So loin historically wasn't as dependent on that. So I'm giving a lot to your listeners here and I'm going to do that for the next probably half hour here, Laura, but I hope to reiterate the consumer demand piece isn't understood as much as supply. It's really important. We monitor that. I'm going to share some resources in a moment to get geeky about how we monitor that. But before I lose people there, we don't send equal parts of the animal to different markets. We have these three different market channels and it gets complex real fast, but that's a global market at work. And I truly believe, sincerely believe, Laura, that our more complicated market that allows a country like the U.S. that's really good, technically efficient at pork production to get its products somewhere else that demands them the most is making the world better, right? We produce more protein at a lower price and the right kind of protein gets to the right people because of that. And nobody should apologize for that. That's a great thing. Uh, it's not unique to U.S. pork, by the way. That's a global thing. There's a globalized system I'm describing there. But it's very complex. And the pandemic is putting some wrenches in that complex system for sure, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you bring up an interesting point where we're 18 months into the pandemic, and yet we continue to see challenges, whether it's through supply chain issues that that we continue to hear about at grocery stores and and elsewhere, not so much necessarily related to bacon, but just, or pork in general, but just commodities, whatever it might be. So where are we at now with the pandemic and how much longer do you maybe potentially speculate that we could have some, some drag in exporting and, and movement of product? Yeah. So there's a lot of components to that one, Laura. So mm-hmm. I'll, you know, I'll start with, let's just call it the physical logistics. And I get a lot of stuff come across my electronic desk every morning. And about once a week, it includes a satellite image that looks off the West Coast of the U.S. And it shows these green dots. I mean, it looks like an old Tetris game, but it's really a green dot. That's a, it's a big ship, not a little little ship, right? Or a big ship that's got a lot of products, in this case, trying to get back into the U.S. If it's setting off the coast of California, it probably came from Asia hauling goods back. Our ports are really bogged down at the moment. That's really important to note. Um, COVID is a component of that, but not the only thing. Access to labor is not a new challenge for you know, global transport. They're working through that. So I don't know when that specific part's going to get better. It needs to get better. It's a cog in the system that's making us less efficient. Um, but there's talk about Walmart and other big box stores that are trying to get their own ships and working around that and doing small boats off big boats. And, you know, it's become big enough of challenge that major players are trying to get innovative. Right. But that's going to add to the cost at the end of the day, you don't do those things for free. So we need to monitor that. That's a component of your question to me. Uh, The second one would be even just more domestically within the country. Once goods are here, there's challenges on truck drivers and getting them spreading around um, again, labor. Right. So I haven't said anything about the live hog yet, but let's get to that as well. We're running, you know, we have, you know, federal inspected rates are back. They're high, both on hogs, cattle and the like here in the U.S. So the industry should be proud. They've kind of recovered. We've got those back up, but that's not easy. You know, all you got to do is browse your email and your emails probably look like mine as well. There's labor challenges there also. Uh, there's labor challenges in raising the live animal, even before we get to that plant. So I'm purposely belaboring labor because I think that's a really important challenge that the entire system has. Some of that is moving pork. Some of that is moving hogs. Some of that is converting hogs into pork. Um, It has to get better and it will get better, but I can't give us a timeline as I, I do believe markets will force it to get better. You're talking to an economist. I think markets will get us there, but I think it's going to be higher labor rates and it's going to push up the price. We're talking about bacon prices being high. I just described why they could go higher. Nothing else changed in that example. Uh, we're in the midst of working through a lot of those logistical challenges. Right. And I, we're certainly seeing that outside of just pork, too. We're seeing that sure. in anything we purchase at the store or elsewhere. Well, well um, Laura, I've started buying, partly because I'm trying to be a good husband and help my wife here, but I've started buying some Christmas items already. Oh, yes, and yeah. Part of that is, the, I mean, we're sitting here in the middle of October and I feel... You know, we don't have the pumpkins out for Halloween yet for context, but 
it's part of a building in stockpiling, if you like. I won't call that hoarding, but it's getting ahead of. I think it's risky to wait till December 21st as a bachelor and go find your girlfriend something, right? I mean, I would encourage us to avoid that kind of thing. Um, Your choices are probably going to be limited if you do that. That's something new for at least folks my age and younger here in the U.S. I mean, all of our society, this is getting a little past pork, but it impacts pork, have kind of navigated towards it just in time. You know, if you're an Amazon Prime member, if you live in a metro city, you could have something as fast as you order it, right? Right. Um, that's great until it doesn't work the way we got used to it working and we're still adjusting to that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, some of that is, well, most of it is society-wide, but pork is not immune. So you're not going to focus on pork, but pork doesn't drive the global logistic system, right? It's right. one of many, many commodities in the world and it's kind of beholden to global trade challenges is what I was trying to impress on folks. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the other thing that, that pops into my, hind, my mind right now, Glenn, is really this idea, well, not idea, but the, the fact that when we're looking at hog prices today. So I heard somebody say the other day, oh, hog prices are really high. Producers are making lots of money right now. Um, obviously, there's context associated with that because ingredients and input costs are not relatively historically where they should be in terms of, of average values. And so what do we see happening with with hog prices relative to input prices over the next six six months to a year, if you can speculate on that. Yeah, so again, beyond labor, we've got corn price, soybean meal price are key inputs in that system. And then, you know, barrel gilt prices. Increasing number of our hog operations in the U.S. have a contract relationship tied to the pork cutout. So that belongs to this discussion as well. And then you can go all the way to retail pork, you know, prices like bacon items and so forth you're talking about. All the above, every item I just mentioned, is subject to a broader inflation discussion. So every single one of those things I just gave you has a labor component, right? Um, They also have a, if oil gets more expensive, it costs more to drive trucks across our, you know, our big country and to get ships to go across the world and the like, and oil is getting more expensive. So economists are increasingly, um, maybe not just concerned, but becoming more convinced It's probably a, we probably transitioned some from just being concerned. Uh, There's been less talk about transitory inflation, or maybe we're going to have inflation for a little bit longer. I've been concerned about that specifically because of labor for quite some time is why I'm belaboring it here. Um, But to answer your question a little bit more directly, I don't think we're done with the production cost aspects of any commodity business going up because there's a lot of inflationary pressures that are just pushing up commodity prices. Again, corn, soybean meal, go down the list. They're the only one I gave us. Um, what's the relevance of that if you run a hog operation is, yeah, your hog prices might be higher, but your input cost and what it takes to produce that hog are probably higher. So we may or may not have a better net margin. So A, you need to understand that. Anything you can do be 1% more cost efficient pays off even more today than it did three years ago. So having an eye towards efficiency and technical efficiency is probably never paid off more. That's the point of that comment. The second thing is the relationship with your banker. So your operating line of credit, and what are your annual discussions, and maybe I hope more than once a year discussions actually, with your financial institution that's supporting you, have become more important because it takes more money to run the operation. So even if you're a break even or you know plus ten dollar per head, you know kind of operation, it takes a lot more money to get that plus ten bucks than it did before. So with more money at stake, you got to understand that. Um, there's more and more talk about interest rates probably going to be coming up in the next couple of years. They're at historic lows. So if you're in good position, I encourage long-term refinancing assessments. It's not my job, so you got to do it, but you certainly should be looking at it. Um, that's a risk that's probably going to change coming forward. Interest rates go up. That changes borrowing costs. That changes the cost of running the operation as well. So uh, we're not out of the woods on these inflationary and just more generally higher production costs kind of being with us. And I think it's going to take more nominal dollars to run a hog operation or a packing plant or a seed stock. It doesn't matter where we're talking in the industry. I think it's going to take more nominal money. It might be deflated and be worth less in real terms, but more nominal money to run your business than it has in the past. Mm-hmm. So do you have any tips or tricks that you would like to provide to our producers today and what they can do to, to kind of manage some of those challenges? Uh, buy your banker coffee. Uh, <laughs> I'll be at half serious, half not. Uh, you could certainly let him buy the coffee. That's okay. But what I mean by that, and I hope, hope people remember that joke, is you need to have a good relationship with the financial institution. And I made the comment earlier about the annual check-in. It needs to be more than annual. I don't know if quarter's right. 
the size of the business will dictate that. You know, the financial institution might come to you if you're a really big component of their business as well, of course. But don't shy away from it. Don't wait for them to call you. Proactively engage would be number one suggestion. Uh, number two would be, I tend to think ag producers in general around the world, that's not unique to hog producers in Iowa, just around the whole world. Ag producers tend to have a more opportunity to be efficient and gain on the cost side than they do on maximizing revenue. And that might sound weird coming from economists who gives a lot of outlook talks from ask where hog prices are going or whatever, but most producers are what we call price takers. So they might once a year negotiate a relationship or something with a packer, but generally they can't change right the price of a barrel in Iowa and so forth. They're sort of a price taker. And that's okay. I'm not saying that's wrong. That's just right what's going on. But if you can be a little more efficient getting your pig's wean purse out up, right, or your average daily gain up or whatever component that is of your more technical production efficiencies, I think there's more opportunity to gain there than there is revenue. And if you can pull down costs, that's a dollar saved on cost is just as nice as a dollar gained on revenue to the bottom line. You may not brag about it back at that coffee shop the same, right? It's more fun to brag about a high sales price, but the banker sort of won't care, right, if the net margins improve. So I would encourage a better ongoing relationship with your financial institution and a renewed eye towards, you know, kind of tightening the turnip, making that, you know, the production costs lower per unit of what you're selling. Yeah, and I think along with that, then, of course, keeping an eye on the commodity markets where corn prices, soybean meal, et cetera, are headed will be a key part to that. A hundred percent. And I'm not a corn market expert, um, but I do monitor it as I mean, obviously I recognize it's a big deal for livestock producers. Um, it, as I understand it, the energy issues that are going on in Europe and what's that's doing with natural gas prices and the like are having an impact on what we think fertilizer and nitrogen prices are and going to be. And go further with that, what will that do to expected production costs to rain, raise a corn crop in Iowa next year? Keep going with that. What's going to be the corn price if we produce less corn and we produce more soybeans as a result? Monitoring that is really important. Uh, I'm not saying sit here and hedge all your corn tomorrow. Don't overreact to that. But I think a relationship with the person that does your price risk management is also important. Monitor for those hedging opportunities. Um, if people are tired of economists like me saying volatility is here to stay. But everybody ought to be convinced of it by now. We've been saying it for quite a while. In a globally connected world where we have crude oil going up and our ag commodities are tied to crude oil more than they were before ethanol, so you're, we're adding volatility because of that connection, uh, we're probably in for some pretty volatile corn markets, I think, in the next year or two. And maybe that presents some opportunities at time, right? If they happen to go down in the story and you're comfortable locking in a lower corn price for feed cost protection, look into that. But you need to be aware of it could go the other direction as well. So be cautious on being naked on the market compared to the past. Very good. I think those are some great tips for our producers. Um, along that line, we talk about efficiencies and supply and demand. Uh, obviously, when we particularly the last year, we've been talking a lot about PERS 144 and its introduction into the marketplace and how that's potentially impacted um, supply of hogs into the packing plant. But Beyond that, you know, we're also talking about ASF because obviously Haiti and, and Dominican Republic have come up positive recently. And so from an economist or sorry, economist perspective, I'll get the word right today. From the no economist perspective today, what how do you see disease and, and its impact on pricing and, and opportunity costs for our producers? Yeah, so I, I mentioned in the intro, I grew up on a fairly finished hog farm in Missouri, and certainly diseases existed then. I mean, I 100% get that. But you're getting a little bit of a farm boy response before you get an economist response. Is My general observation is um, the topic of disease has grown, become more rampant. And I think part of that is because we have more globally connected right system than when I was back in high school. So that's natural. Um, it's for somebody else to say if the hogs are more susceptible to disease than they used to be. You know, that's a totally different discipline. But I think there's something to that that belongs on the table to talk about here a little bit. Uh, but when you have a new disease, not new, but new to our country, ASF, that's now in our hemisphere, that we, at least on the American side of this, have been monitoring developments, right, ongoing developments in Asia and Europe for some time. And it's well documented what that's done to the production base in each of those countries and to the cost of rebuilding a herd. And at least in the case of China, how they're probably not rebuilding what they had before, but they're also changing and modernizing herd as they go. 
the role of disease and what the global pork production system looks like is you can't even compare it to what it was like when I was in high school because of what I'm laying out for your listeners there. Um, I encourage our producers to recognize that we do have a global lead, ours being the U.S. here, is we do have a globally leading technologically efficient system, but nothing is perfectly protected against disease. So we have a lot of tools out there that fall in this biosecurity realm. And biosecurity is a very broad term that means lots of different things. Uh, everything from disinfecting your boots to having air filtration on the barn. And that's a really wide spectrum. And they vary from pretty much cheap to really, really expensive, the way I give those two examples. There's a lot of things in between, of course. Um, serious production decisions need to include a component of biosecurity assessment in the modern world. Now, what that assessment results for your operation will differ by operation. There's a reason the economist has to say we don't have every barn air filtered. It's not pragmatic in every situation. There's a place for it. I'm not anti it. Don't take my comments wrong. But there's a reason not every market hog in the U.S. went through a system of air filtration. The arguments against having clean boots via disinfected don't hold as well, right? So the barriers for implementing some of those closer to no-brainer biosecurity efforts um, don't hold water compared to the past. So where exactly you fall on that is going to be situation dependent. But I strongly encourage all our operations to reassess where they're at. Some of these implementations get cheaper over time. We get better at biosecurity. So the reality of they're less disruptive, right? They may not disrupt your workforce as much as we once thought they did. Or once they're implemented up front, it doesn't change the flow of pigs and all these kind of things. Well, that example of the effective cost changing is yet another reason to periodically reassess. Because what might have been a rational no in 2018, it didn't make sense to do this. Uh, sitting here in October of 2021, it may be a rational, yes, I should. And the way I presented that was simply a, maybe the cost isn't the same as it once was. Also, we have to recognize, and you threw ASF out as the bait for this, this part of our exchange, but the potential risk can also change. And when we have African swine fever in our hemisphere, the potential of a challenge there has certainly been elevated. I'm not an epidemiologist. I can't say how likely that is. I hope not to live through that. Um, but there'll be real economic consequences if it does. And each individual operation to protect themselves should answer that question. And then the irony is collectively, the more each of them do, the better the industry is collectively protected as well. That's kind of the public good component of biosecurity. Um, myself and Lee Schultz at Iowa State have done some work on this as an economist. And it gets at the whole point about what kind of governmental uh, biosecurity indemnity type relationships should we have. Um, you know, the public good, private good gets real complicated real fast. Uh, we're living in a pandemic. We have that on the use of vaccines. There's a private public argument there. There's those things show up in a lot of our livelihoods these days, Laura. But as it relates to ASF and biosecurity in the U.S. swine industry, uh, some of the work I've done with Lee in recent years would point to, um, we would encourage, I'm speaking for me, I won't, I'll let Lee off the hook on this, but it's research we've done together. Um, if the federal government had uh, compensation indemnity policies that took into account what I would call good faith biosecurity effort and basically made your governmental compensation a function of documented good faith biosecurity effort, we show we actually would have additional biosecurity implemented. And that's pretty straightforward economics because it's part of your a worst case. If we have a bad event, the government cuts a bigger check to help you. Um, I would encourage us to have a little deeper thinking of aligning private and public efforts is why I'm saying that. And even your listeners outside of the U.S., right, if they're sitting in Germany or wherever, uh, there's a similar private public discussion that belongs there. And I think more public nudging, having public policies that have a nudge kind of embedded in them could help us protect against diseases, in this case, ASF. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the challenges that sometimes I hear come up is, well, we don't really know what the impact will be on ASF or in, in the U.S. And we certainly can predict from PERS, if we look at enough historical information here in the U.S., we kind of know every three to five years we get tend to get a really bad strain and has pretty economically impactful um, functions. But what do we do when we have a disease like ASF that we really don't know what it's going to do to our markets to help us do that cost justification for biosecurity implementation. Yeah, and, and it is harder. I don't disagree with that at all. So the, you know, the price and quantity impacts have a bigger <laughs> uncertainty band around them. 
to any kind of jargon is what you just described there. And I 100% agree with that. But what I know with a high level of certainty is that if ASF shows up anywhere in the U.S. and is documented for at least a period of time, whether that impacted one hog or at the extreme or whole country, and heaven forbid that happened, but what I'm trying to impress on folks is the magnitude of hogs impacted isn't as important on day one. We'll lose export markets, I'm confident, initially. Every other episode like this, and not just in the hog industry, but that tends to be a first reaction. Um, I hope it's not for long. Topics about regionalization come up real fast. I hope we're able to contain the disease. That whole song and dance everybody's aware of. But one thing I am very aware of is regardless of the quantity impact initially, there will be a price effect that is negative because we'll lose the export market channel. And for context, that's you know a fourth or more of the economic pie at each point in our production system. Uh, remember earlier, I also made the comment, we don't send equal parts of the hog everywhere. So now all of a sudden we'll have certain parts that used to get exported that will now stay at home. And they won't have nearly the same value in their second, third, maybe 25th best market compared to before. Uh, we literally sell everything but the oink on a hog, everything but the moo on a cow and the like. Those are markets at work. But when that those items have to go to a quote unquote inferior market because the previously preferred markets aren't open, you take a massive hit on the value of the carcass, not just those animals. So I know with certainty there'll be an adverse effect. How big of a negative to put is the uncertainty. I 100% agree. Um, and that is a challenge. I get that. But it's also, we make decisions in that realm also on other parts of our life. Um, I don't know the ceiling on corn price next year, as an example. I mean, I hope not to see $10 corn, but as an example, things are lined up where we could have a corn price that we didn't anticipate before. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not predicting $10 corn price, but we live in an era where we can have prices we didn't think we'd see before. Um, last 18 months, we've seen that in lots of ways. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, lastly, if we think about any resources that might be available to our producers or to others that are interested in, in learning more about what's happening in the U.S. economy and, and particularly pork production, do you have any resources that they could go to? Yeah, so I, I'm going to take liberty to plug two. Uh, so, so one is actually, I was pulling information more broadly from a project called the Meat Demand Monitor. It is a project that's funded by the beef and the pork checkoff here in the U.S. It's currently based here at K-State. Our website is called agmanager.info, or you can Google me and email me, and I'll connect folks if they can't find it. But every month we put out additional pork demand information, and it is domestic uh, food service versus retail, bacon versus pork chops and the like to get even more honed in on this. Um, there's a lot of good things in that, you know, that ongoing updated barometer of pork demand. Uh, a lot of stuff you and I have talked about today, there's a tracking of that. So if that's of interest to your listeners, I encourage you to make use of that. Usually the first week of each month, there's a report that covers the prior month. So, you know, they, that's that's there. The second thing would be, uh, this is going to be plugging Iowa State, actually. But Lee Schultz, I mentioned as a collaborator here, uh, I consider Lee Schultz the point person. Uh, it, disclaimer, I've actually been his advisor in the past. So, you know, I'll give you that up front. I'm biased. Um, as long as I tell the world that, that's okay. But I think Lee is very good. Uh, he has his pulse as an academic economist better than anybody else I know on the hog industry and not just in Iowa, but the country and the world. And all the resources Lee puts out, I would encourage folks to take advantage of as well. So two resources, not one for you, Laura. Perfect. Wonderful. We'll take whatever we can get. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for, for individuals after listening to your conversation. Um, are there any key points that you'd like our audience to take away from today? Yeah, so uh, demand matters, and then an exclamation point. So if anybody's listening to this audio and they're taking notes, demand matters, exclamation point. Um, it's very easy on the production side of the industry, and most listening to this probably have a production bent, to monitor the number of hogs we're selling, right, or the pounds per pig and those production metrics. And that's good. That's I mean, we need to do that as well, but it's not sufficient anymore. We need to understand also the demand for your item. And your item might be a wean pig or it might be a barrel of gill. I get that. But those are derived demands from the ultimate demand for a pork item. So the demand for bacon that you brought up a few times is core to our discussions. Um, one of the core reasons bacon prices is up is the world wants bacon. That's good, right? Nobody's making people pay a lot for bacon. They just want bacon. My household eats a ton of bacon. We have strong demanders for it. So demand matters with an exclamation point. If you didn't forget anything else, uh, if you don't remember anything else, excuse me. And the second part would be, I think, public-private relationships around biosecurity could be 
modernized, interwoven a little bit more. Um, I think we can nudge livestock producers, in this case, hog producers, but more generally livestock producers around the world to implement things that have a longer term payoff. If they internalize, the government's going to help them in a different way if they do. Now, there's a political challenge reality to that where you got to defend cutting a check different for this neighbor from this neighbor. And I get that. That gets into politics real fast. Uh, we can speak to that in our next podcast if we want. But um, as the economist, I think that's a more carefully designed policy that we have found would nudge additional biosecurity effort, all else equal. And I think that tend would help that would help us have fewer disease outbreaks or when you have it conditionally, they'd be more contained. And ironically, then public taxpayers would cut less checks because then we'd have less of a spread. So um, those would be the two things I'd try to reemphasize here. That's great. Thank you for that insight. It's been a very enjoyable 25 minutes or so. Sure. Um, the last thing we like to always ask our guest speakers, a couple of series of questions that it's the same for everybody. So the first one we like to ask you is, do you have a swine resource book or website that you would recommend to the audience? Yeah, so this would be circular to my, I planted it earlier, and I'll just say it again, would be the Lee Schultz, the Iowa State website, uh, more generally, because that helps folks monitor their own cost compared to, you can benchmark, basically, if you know your books, you can compare against what Iowa State is putting out, is why I say that, uh, and Lee's connect with lots of other networks, so that's valuable. And then the second one would be is basically anything that the pork checkoff is involved with. The meat demand monitor is one specific project. So we talked about that earlier, but there's a whole suite of things that, you know, it's producer funded effort. And I encourage producers in particular in the U.S. to make use of that. Uh, there's a wealth of information that I would argue is probably underutilized under that pork checkoff umbrella. So go to their website and track them down. Perfect. And the next question we like to ask is, what about something that's not related to swine? Are there any books that you would recommend to our audience today? So it, Partially related to swine, but more generally a philosophical point is there's a lot of populist discussions around the world these days, uh, questioning the value of trade, arguing about market share for one segment of an industry versus another and things like that. And I have a personal concern that that gets in the road of efforts to grow the economic pie and then talk about the subsequent impacts. But instead, it's like fighting over today's pie is mentally the way I describe that. And while we're talking here, I pulled up. So there is a book. The title is Grow the Pie. Uh, Alex Edmonds is the author of that. You can get it on Amazon. But more generally, what I'm hoping your listeners pick up on that is a more broader kind of business and philosophical approach of being aware of it takes a lot of collective business interest to produce pork in the modern world. And I think working together to produce what the public wants to grow the business opportunity, in this case, pie, economic pie is the analogy we're using, is the key to long-term sustainability. Um, anybody can strike a better deal tomorrow and get a better piece of today's pie. And if you're going to retire next week, that might work because you don't worry about burning business relationships and you don't have a long-term focus. And we don't need to understand why bacon demands high because we won't be around in a month, right? And so forth. But longer term, I think understanding why the public wants pork, understanding that, giving that to them higher volumes at better deals. And it's going to change over time, right? The composition of the world is changing. So understanding why I believe that total protein pie is growing and what can we do to keep that growing is step number one. And then we can get into other things. But if we do other things, it's a little bit short-sighted is my general concern. Um, that's not unique to the pork industry at all, but I think it applies to the pork industry as well. So that'd be my response. So growing the pie. Just grow the look. pie. Grow the pie. Okay, perfect. The The last question we like to ask is really if you envision somebody that you have identified as successful, however you want to identify success, what characteristic stands out about them that you think has helped them become successful? So two traits I would point to is one, they recognize that God gave them two ears and one mouth. And I'm a fast speaker, so I'm being a little bit hypocrit uh, hypocritical when I say this, uh, but good listeners that think before they, in, the, in this comment, speak, but more generally before you take action, right? So before you make a biosecurity decision, you listen, you learn, you research, and then you make a decision, right? Before you decide whether to protect against a corn price change we talked about earlier, you listen, you study, you research, then you take action. So that two to one ratio of two ears to one mouth, your listeners will probably remember. That's why I give it to them. So that's one trait. Uh, the second one would be is they know their comparative advantage. 
So this is an economist that believes wholeheartedly that somebody that understands their comparative advantage, what they're better than somebody else at, or maybe even at the country level, what U.S. is better at than another country. And there's different levels to do this at. People that actually recognize that and then make business decisions after they leverage it tend to be more successful. So you, we can all work on things that improve our faults, and there's a place for that. But recognizing your comparative strengths and then magnifying that and making business decisions around that and just you know full throttle around it tends to align with those I see are successful. So two ears to one mouth, and then knowing and acting upon your comparative advantage would be my two responses for you, Laura. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Glenn, I see our time is up. I do want to thank you again for being with us today. And for our audience, this is Dr. Glenn Tonser from Kansas State University. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thanks for having me on, Laura. Imagine if, with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven-week-long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world-class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.